governments of such important trusts in this land. Let your blessing descend upon them here assembled and grant that they may, as in your presence, treat and consider all matters that shall come under their deliberation in so just and faithful a manner so as to promote your honor and glory and to advance the good of those whose interests you have committed to their charge. Amen. Item three. Item three on the order paper proclamation by the right honourable speaker of parliament. Now members, start transform it now seventy two of twenty twenty. Proclamation by the Speaker of the Parliament of Uganda. Whereas under Article ninety five two of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, a session of parliament shall be held at such place within Uganda and shall commence at such time as the speaker may by proclamation appoint. And whereas the fourth session of the 10th parliament commenced on the 6th day of June 2019, and parliament was prorogued on the 2nd of June 2020, aware that the president of Uganda is required under Article 101, sub Article 1 of the Constitution to deliver to parliament an address on the state of the nation at the beginning of each session. Noting that it is expedient that Parliament receives the address of the President on the State of the Nation, now therefore, in exercise of the powers conferred upon the Speaker by Clause 2 of Article 95 of the Constitution, I hereby proclaim that Parliament shall sit at Parliament buildings on the fourth day of June 2020 at 1400 hours to receive the State of the Nation address from the President. Given under my hand at Parliament House, Kampala, this 26th day of May 2020, Rebecca Kadaga, Speaker of Parliament. Item 4 on the order paper, communication from the Chair. Now, members, uh, I would like to inform you that uh, this morning, uh, the Constitutional Court uh, made a ruling on the issue of our colleagues Basman Wasalira, MP for Jiri Municipality, Naibo Leo Datumwesje, Shema Municipality, General Patrick Ochan of Apache Municipality, General Rabu Indore Tassis of Ivanda Municipality, General Hashim Suleiman of Nebi Municipality, the Honorable Loki Abraham, the MP for Kotido Municipality, and uh, uh, the court says they have, the applicants have satisfied the conditions Necessary for grant of stay of execution. They have granted the stay of execution in the following terms. A, the decision, decree, and orders of the Constitutional Court in Constitutional Petition Number 20 of 2018, delivered 27th December 2019, are hereby stayed pending the determination of the applicant's intended appeals or until further orders of this court. The registrar of the Constitutional Court is hereby directed to expeditiously produce the record of proceedings to enable the applicants to file their appeal. The course of this application shall abide the outcome of the intended appeals. Issued today by the Justice Stella Raja Moko, Judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Ruby Apio Aweri, Justice of the Supreme Court, and Justice Lillian, Professor Lillian Tivatema, Echidukuvinza, Justice of the Supreme Court. So the honor members may continue to do their work until the, the legal issues are sorted out. Secondly, honor members, you may recall that on 2nd June 2020, the House amended its rules to provide for a virtual parliament. The House, among others, was expanded beyond the physical presence of members in the chamber of parliament to include virtual presence via designated uh, digital platform. Consequently, the powers vested in the speaker under Rule 8, one of the rules of procedure, I've designated the virtual chair of state for the president in the house for purpose of delivering to parliament an address on the state of the nation as mandated under Article 1011 of the Constitution. I would like to remind you, on our members, that as provided by Rule 236A, the rules of uh, procedure apply to all parliamentary processes online and to a member virtually present in the house unless otherwise expressly stated. Therefore, 
uh, uh, as for rule 10, the house shall be called to order and sat in silence when the president enters or leaves the house. Two, the president shall be heard in silence. Three, the address of the president shall not be followed by any comment or question. Four, the president will not participate in the proceedings of the house in any way. So he's now present in this house. <laughs> Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, First Lady, Your Excellency, Vice President, Mr. Edward Sekandi, my Lord, the Chief Justice, Right Honourable Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Right Honourable the Prime Minister and Leader of Government Business, and the Deputy Prime Ministers, Honourable Ministers, the Leader of the Opposition in Parliament, the Ministers of State, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Honourable Members of Parliament, the Head of Public Service and Secretary to the Cabinet, the Chief of Defence Forces, the Inspector General of Police, Commissioner General of Prisons, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Your Excellency, our guests, together with the Honourable Members, to the State of the Nation Address, which signifies the opening of the fifth session of the 10th Parliament. Today's address is significant because the fifth and the last state of nation address in the 10th parliament. Indeed, today we are operating using a hybrid of virtual and physical parliament as the address will be managed from two venues, partially in the state house and partially here. But Uganda parliament is not alone in this situation. Many parliaments are facing many challenges to their effectiveness. The current COVID-19 pandemic is stretching the capacity of Commonwealth parliaments to remain fully functional, requiring costly resources, specialist services, and with the, the ability to be rapidly adaptive to the new ways of working. To survive such pressures, parliaments, parliaments need to have robust leaders, services, and finances to support such pressures. Your Excellency, following your first address to the nation on the COVID-19 pandemic, my office contacted the World Ministry of Health and the World Health Organization in Kampala, requested them to provide specialist and technical information to determine whether the measures in place at Parliament could provide safe access and use of the parliamentary facilities. I'm glad to report that upon receiving the observations and recommendations from the WHO team, we treated various precautionary and safety measures and improved on the facilities available to enable Parliament to operate as follows. Permits were suspended, except those which, were, uh, which had urgent business to, to process. Access was curtailed to visitors to Parliament. Body temperature checks were instituted at the main entrance of Parliament, together with hand washing and sanitization. Only parliamentary staff whose services were deemed to be essential were selected to continue working, while others were working from home. The sitting of Parliament was shifted first from the parliamentary chamber to the conference hall, and then to the tents in the parking yard. The rules of procedure were amended as we have had to address circumstances imposed by COVID. We still observe social distance and the use of masks, which has now been emphasized. We introduced a hiding system of deliberations in Parliament, which some members will be allowed to participate through a virtual system, while others are physically present here. Uh, during this uh, function on our guests, his Excellency the President will highlight the activities and achievements of the government during the previous year and present to Parliament the plans, programs and strategies that government intends to pursue during the fifth session. I want to thank the chairperson and the member of this House because it's because of their continued commitment and vigilance that we have been able to continue getting business for the plenary and also handling our constitutional obligations like the budget and the revenue uh, collection bills. Your Excellency, in terms of legislation, the, f the fourth session has put up a commendable performance as Parliament has enacted 25 bills as compared to 11 in the first session, 17 in the second session, and 26 in the third session. We need to mention the Kampala Capital City Authority Amendment Bill, which was finally passed having moved back and forth since 2015. But it is not worth it that Parliament lost a total of 35 working hours in terms of plenary sitting as a result of the instant of curfew at 7 p.m. because we had to close our business at 5. 
the committees of the House lost 1,800 hours for the same reasons. Three private members' bills were passed in the fourth session, namely the Institute of Parliamentary Studies Bill 2020, the National Local Content Bill 2019, and the Law Revision Penalties Criminal Matters, Miscellaneous uh, Amendment Bill 2015. We also had the Human Rights Enforcement Bill earlier in the year, and Minimum Wages Bill. The Institute of Parliamentary Studies Bill is intended uh, to play a great role in providing training for legislators at the national, district, and parliamentary staff, and other public servants within Uganda and the East African region. The National Local Content Bill was moved and uh, passed uh, a few weeks ago. The bill seeks to impose a local content obligation on a person using public money utilizing Uganda's natural resources or carrying on an activity requiring a license, among other things. The law refusal penalties of criminal matters with Senator's Amendment Bill 2015 was moved and uh, affected the following laws, the Penal Code Act and Terrorism Act, Uganda Police Defense Forces Act, and the Trial on Indictments Act. The aim was to remove references to the death, mandatory death penalty prescribed by those laws and to restrict the application of the death penalty to the most serious crimes by converting maximum penalties prescribed in those laws in two other, other penalties, uh, which are detailed in the Act. Your Excellency, you return two bills to this House, the Minimum Wages Bill 2015 and the Genetic Engineering Bill 2018, which is yet to be uh, considered again by the House. Uh, your Excellency, in your wisdom, withheld consent to those bills and returned them, and I uh, will implore the members to uh, look uh, more carefully and uh, see how we can deal with the, the remaining part of the bill. Excellency, Article 94B and Rule 120 and 121 of our Rules of Procedure permits members of Parliament to move private members' bills. And members are increasingly using this opportunity to seek leave of Parliament to present their bills. In the fourth session, leave was granted 10 members of Parliament to introduce the following private members' bills. The Real Estate Agency Bill 2020, by Honorable Tieno Okot, the Fish Amendment Bill by Honorable Okelo Anthony, the Leadership Code Amendment Bill by Honorable Dr. Yomoki, the Constitutional Amendment Bill by Honorable Paul Muiru, the Establishment and Management of Markets Bill by Honorable Margaret Rabushaija, the Constitutional Amendment Bill by Honorable Jack Odur Lutanya, the Tenary Drugs and Feeds Bill 2019 by Honorable Fred Mwesige, the Constitution Amendment Bill by Honor 2019 by Honorable Wilfred Nwagaba. The Constitution Amendment Bill by Honorable Michael Mawanda Budamaranga. And the Parliamentary Pensions Amendment Bill by Honorable Rumijio Achia. Uh, Your Excellency, there are many areas in our jurisprudence that require new legislation, and this is not being addressed as expected by the government. It is therefore necessary that government expedition reviews the laws on our statute books, and following the enactment of the Law Revision Act 2019, many laws were passed before and immediately after independence are now archaic and out of touch with the current realities. For instance, the Ferris Act of 1905, that's Cap 358, the Vessels Act 1904, Cap 362, the Rivers Act 1907, Cap 357, the Liquor Act 1960, Cap 93, among many others. I therefore urge Excellency that the Uganda Reform Commission and also the past parliamentary council be supported to work on updating our laws. We look forward to Cabinet's uh, expeditious handling of the outputs of the, of the first parliamentary council. In terms of oversight, Parliament was able to handle the following. Uh, resolutions passed to authorize government to borrow nine resolutions to grant leave for introduction members' bills, as I've already indicated, were ten, paying tribute were six, other resolutions on various matters, 28, mutual statements considered, 105, threatened by the leader of opposition, one, urgent questions responded to, 314, questions for oral answer responded to, eight, Question responded to during Prime Minister's time, 252. Committee reports adopted, 15. 
statements by members five, reports of parliamentary delegations 20, report by the leader of opposition one, response by leader of opposition to the state of the nation address one, petition concluded one. At the international level, members of parliament have effectively engaged in parliamentary diplomacy at fora like the Inter-Parliamentary Union, Communist Parliamentary Association, the EU ACP uh, Joint Assembly, Pan African Parliament, the National Conference of the Great Lakes Region, among others. We also have, of course, our colleagues in the East African Legislative Assembly. Your Excellency, Parliament successfully hosted this fourth parliamentary conference and related meetings from 2nd September 29th, 2019. This conference was well planned and handled, and many jurisdictions in the Commonwealth and the participants who attended the conference communicate their appreciation and compliments for the organization and the Parliament of Uganda has been approached at local and even international level to assist in hosting big conferences of the same nature. I wish to express our appreciation, Your Excellency, for you, your personal involvement in the organization of that conference, government support, financial and logistical, which has made it possible, uh, which made it possible for us to host that conference gave us visibility at national and global level, enhanced hotel and hospitality standards in the country, provided an opportunity for learning, sharing, knowledge and networking on best parliamentary practices and socioeconomic interventions, enhanced our capacity to uh, innovate, uh, also assisted in addressing the gaps the country has in terms of transport. For instance, as we speak now, the Parliament handed over its buses to the Minister of Health, transport workers, and number of patients, and this has been going on for the last three months. Your Excellency, I wish to report that Parliament enjoys good working relations with the watchdog agencies, like the Auditor General, Inspector General of Government, Uganda Human Rights Commission, and Equal Opportunities Commission, among others. I'm happy to report that uh, information on gender and equity compliance has been useful to the committees in their oversight work. We continue to receive unfortunate allegations from the public and mass media on corruption, abuse of authority, and office in the ministries, departments, and agencies, as well as violation of human rights. The Office of the Speaker and Parliament will continue to engage watchdog agencies with the view of working out better strategies of enforcing accountability by providing an independent assurance of the use of public resources fighting corruption, abuse of authority and of public office, and effective measures to promote human rights in Uganda. Last uh, session I had made an undertaking that any reports from the agencies would have been considered. Unfortunately, because of many interruptions, this was not possible, but we shall make an effort during this fifth session. Your Excellency, Parliament receives many petitions from individuals and general public on matters related to the functioning of ministries, departments and agencies. Some of these organizations are not satisfactory executing their responsibilities, causing dis dissatisfaction from the public. A number of MDAs have customer service charters or client service uh, uh, arrangements which uh, set out service standards that individuals and public expect from them and how such services would be delivered. In terms of complaints handled on this future resolution, MDAs need to improve so that complaints and disputes are dealt with quickly and clients are informed about the progress and outcomes of their complaints or disputes. MDAs also need to carry out sensitization to the use of mass media, public outreaches, to explain what their responsibilities entail. Once that is sorted out, Parliament will be able to handle more business as well as complaints before the Parliament as petitions. However, Your Excellency, there is a matter that has repeatedly come to this House since October 2013. This concerns the money owed to the Uganda South Sudan traders. Following the complaints, the Government of Uganda held negotiations with the Government of South Sudan has agreed that the Government of Uganda commits to pay US dollars 41,623,513 owed to the Uganda South Sudan traders by the Government of the Republic of South Sudan. Parliament has cried out its role in respect to that matter. To date, however, many of the small traders have not been paid. This is uh, unjust and inconsiderate for Ugandans to continue to be treated like this. Excellency, according to your, on your intervention, so that these traders' payments can be settled. Uh, in the same vein, a number of court awards 
from statutory tribunals remain unpaid for a very long time. These cases require urgent redress. Unfortunately, ultimately, they end up in Parliament as petitions. Your Excellency, this date marks the commencement of the fifth and last session of the Tenth Parliament. It is worth noting that presidential, parliamentary, and general elections are scheduled this particular session. This means there will be limited time available to Parliament to handle business. Once party nominations take place, it will be difficult to balance the public responsibilities as well as individual interests until after the general elections. I therefore, urge the Prime Minister and the government business to ensure that government business deemed important or urgent be brought to the House within the first two months of this session to enable a committee to process them in time for Parliament's consideration. Parliament has continued to engage the public in uh, activities both in Kampala and outside Kampala. Committees have carried out field visits and engaged the public on various bills, policies, and programs to seek their input. Parliament has also conducted outreach programs, the Parliament Health Week, the Parliament Week, Science and Technology Week. The committees held 845 sittings during the session and carried out 44 outreaches in various parts of the country. I would like to thank the government for the resources that have been available to Parliament for its operations. Without this financial support, the achievements enumerated above would not have been possible. Today, a few of our members have not been able to attend. The Honorable Katol Wama, MP Vaga South, is uh, still hospitalized. The Honorable Francis Zake is equally indisposed. Honor members, as the practice, the business of Parliament we had before the committees, the House was prorogued, have been saved. I call upon the whips to expedite the process of assigning members to committees in line with the rules of procedure. As usual, we assign the independent members to committees. On behalf of Parliament, I welcome you all the State of the Nation address and appreciate your kind response to our invitation despite the circumstances. Thank you very much. the right honorable speaker to his excellence the president to deliver to parliament an address on the state of the nation in accordance with clause one of article 101 of the constitution uh, part two of our proceeding invitation to his excellence the president of the republic of uganda by the speaker of parliament deliver the state of the nation address for us under article 101 clause one of the constitution the President has to deliver to Parliament an address on the state of the nation at the beginning of every session, and whereas the Speaker has just proclaimed the commencement of the first session of the 10th Parliament of Uganda, now therefore, as Speaker of Parliament, I now invite His Excellency the President to deliver to Parliament an address on the state of the nation this fourth day of June 2020. Your Excellency, you are welcome to address Parliament and the country. His Excellency the His Excellency the Vice President the Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament His Lordship the Chief Justice the Right Honorable Deputy Speaker, His Lordship Deputy Chief Justice, the Right Honorable Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Deputy Prime Ministers, Honorable Members of Parliament, Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, and all the citizens of Uganda and our visitors. Madam Speaker, in fulfillment of the constitutional requirement under Article 101, Clause 1 of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, I am here to deliver the State of the Nation Address 2020. 
while still fighting precisely at Kanyara camp in Ngoma sub-county, the combined meeting of the High Command and the National Resistance Council adopted the 10 points of the NRM political program. These 10 points were as follows. Number one, restoration of democracy. Number two, restoration of security. Number three, consolidation of national unity and elimination of all forms of sectarianism. Number four, defending and consolidating national independence. Number five, building an independent, integrated, and self-sustaining national economy. Number six, restoration and improvement of social services and rehabilitation of the war ravaged areas. Number seven, elimination of corruption and the misuse of power. Number eight, redressing errors that have resulted in the dislocation of some sections of the population. Number nine, cooperation with other African countries. Number 10, doing all this following an economic strategy of a mixed economy. As far as the economy is concerned, of these 10 points, the crucial ones are number five, number nine, and number 10. Point number five, talks of building an economy that is independent, integrated, and self-sustaining. Point number nine, talks of cooperation among African countries. In other words, markets integration among other factors. Point number 10, talks of using the strategy of a mixed economy, government and private enterprises working together in doing all this, rather than being morbidly fixated ideologically on either private enterprise alone or public enterprises alone. As usual, many of the people did not bother to grasp the importance of these points, or indeed of the seven other points. They thought that we were just talking to justify our role in national issues. On account of this, even when we captured power, we continued to face resistance in pushing these points from elements of the political class and the bureaucratic class. We have actually continued to be in the bush even when we are in the government and have continued to wage guerrilla warfare against the new colonial and colonial interests in Uganda. Much more could have been achieved if it was not for this opposition. It is the partial implementation of our program that is helping us to survive in this crisis of the virus and to even use the virus to take off in terms of the social economic transformation we have been talking about since the 1960s. When this global crisis therefore descended on the world, I started hearing screams of pessimism coming from all sorts of sources. Immediately, I authored two documents and I will distribute them to all the honorable members of parliament that talked about one, the real economy on the one hand, as well as the vulnerable economy on the other hand. The real economy is the economy that deals with the nine basic human needs of food, clothing, shelter, 
medicine, security, physical infrastructure like the railways and the roads and the electricity and the telephones, health, health infrastructure like hospitals, the education infrastructure, schools, etc., as well as the teaching of numeracy, literacy, skilling, and intellectuality, and the spiritual work, the churches, mosques, etc. This is the real economy. It deals with the basic human needs. It is durable. Even in wars, this economy will survive. It is comprised of agriculture, industry, ICT, and some of the services, like the professional services such as engineering, medical, and legal professional services. This economy deals with basic human needs, as already pointed out. It is, as already pointed out, also durable and reliable. It is also beneficial to society. If we are talking of nutrition, human nutrition would say that it would be bodybuilding or body nourishing, adding nutrients to the body. It is also an economy for survival and prosperity. If you want to survive as a people, that is the way to go. If you want to prosper as a country, that is the way to go. Real economy. If you want to benefit, the way to go is the way of the real economy. The other economy is the vulnerable economy. This vulnerable economy also happens to be the economy of leisure and pleasure. Leisure and pleasure are optional. If you can get them, it is all right. If you cannot, you will however survive nevertheless. These are activities that add leisure and pleasure to a human being. But if necessary, he or she can survive without them. They are optional and additional. These are the sectors like tourism, entertainment, bars, nightclubs, cruises on ocean liners, theater going, import business for luxuries, such as carpets, perfumes, wines, spirits, wigs, etc. Some of these activities are not only for pleasure, leisure, and optional, they are also parasitic. They take nutrients from us and do not add any energies for our growth. These are activities like the imports of luxuries. Luxuries are good. We should, however, produce them ourselves. It is wrong to buy luxuries from other countries when they buy little from us. Banyankore called this Ovaji, squandering wealth. Some of the leisure sectors, although vulnerable, they are at least beneficial. These are sectors like tourism, entertainment, etc. They bring in money instead of taking out money out of Uganda. Nevertheless, to have a farm economy, we must go back to the Bible in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 26, 27. It talks of a foolish man that built his house on sand. And the exact quotation goes like this in quotes, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall." End of quotes. That is a foolish man who built his house on sand. It is now 78 days 
since the lockdown we launched on the 18th of March 2020 in response to the pandemic of the coronavirus. In that, in that lockdown, we have stopped all international flights into and out of Uganda. The tourists are no longer coming. Foreign investors are not coming. The Ugandans abroad are maybe sending less money to their relatives because they are also facing problems where they are, etc., etc. However, Uganda is still standing and coping with the virus, the floods, the landslides, the rising water levels in the lakes, the locusts, the floating islands, the security of the country, the crime, and feeding millions of our people, etc., etc. Why? It is on account of some of the few of our ideas that we have managed to implement in spite of the endless opposition that we always face. We have built a strong army. We have built a powerful resistance council system. The fact that it is not well facilitated financially notwithstanding. We have surplus electricity on account of the correct prioritization with the, with the support of parliament in 2006. We have a good road network of tarmac roads totaling 5,111 kilometers. On account of our agriculture, our correct agricultural policy, we have a lot of agricultural products for food, for food security and for commerce in the form of bananas, maize, beans, Irish potatoes, cassava, coffee, tea, cotton, cocoa, milk, beef, fish, poultry, eggs, flowers, etc., etc. Apart from feeding us, these agricultural products end up by earning for us US dollars 2 billion or 2,005 million if we take the year 2019. Even in this lockdown, since March, the foreign agricultural products have earned for us as follows. In March, coffee brought in $45.87 million in the month of March alone. In April, coffee brought in $36.9 million. Tea brought in five million in March and six million in April. That's that's during the time of the of the lockdown. Fish in March brought in fifteen about fifteen million dollars. In April it brought in about seven million dollars. Maize in March it brought in ten million dollars. In April, six million dollars. Our agriculture is therefore not only feeding, feed, feeding us almost 100 percent, but also earning dollars for us of the magnitude of two billion dollars a year. Our correct policy on the private sector, the corruption and obstruction of many of our public servants notwithstanding, has also attracted a total of 5,200 factories. These are producing cement, steel bars, soap, mattresses, mabati, sugar, cooking oil, rubber tires, textiles, beverages, beers, etc., that bring in a total of 2.1 billion dollars. This sector is ready for even a qualitative change by starting manufacturing buses, minibuses, pickups, small cars, bicycles, etc. 
the ICT sector is a growing one, employing 1.3 million persons with 380,000 companies engaged in information technology, in telecommunications, broadcasting, postal and courier and audiovisual. Therefore, these are the sectors of the economy that will not easily collapse because of the cor cor coronavirus. The son of Mr. Warren Buffett, whom they claim to be the second richest man in the world, came to visit me at Ixozi. I asked him how many cattle his father had. He told me that he did not, have, he did not own cattle, but owned railways and ETC. I had never seen a rich man without cattle and land, and I told him so. Recently, I saw some people trying to get rid of shares in the airline companies as hot potatoes because of the coronavirus pandemic. The airlines, we are running into problems. My farm based wealth, land on which the farm takes, uh, farming takes place, are going nowhere. My cows were here yesterday, they're here today, and they will be here tomorrow. And they were here since the time of Jesus, the cows. In spite of the obstructions by the, the neo-colonial actors and foreign backers, Uganda is able to stand up today whether whether this storm because of the correct actions we took. The vulnerable portions of the economy have collapsed. However, the real economy is standing up and expanding, especially in agriculture and industries. If we take industry, in just the last few months of this crisis of the virus, by March 2020, we had only two factories known as Saraya East Africa Limited and the, and the railway industries making sanitizers. We now have 107 factories. So in the lockdown, factories are expanding. We had only two making sanitizers. Now we have 107. By March 2020, there was not even one factory making masks in Uganda. And we were told that there was a global shortage, ETC, ETC. I told some of our factories, including Nitir, Yuri, NEC, ETC, to make these masks. We now have factories making the masks. We received a request from 61 factories, but only 10 have been satisfied. There was a big shortage of PPP, PPEs, personal protect, protective equipment in the world. I told some of our factories, including Mulwana, to solve this problem. They have risen, risen to the occasion, and they are producing the PPEs. The pharmaceutical plants, like the quality chemicals, the scientists, like Dr. Nanturia, have all joined the battle of banishing the unhealthy dependency on the outside for our livelihood and paying a lot of money in the process as well as losing a lot of jobs. In the area of manufacturing, manufacturing medicines, there are young Ugandans that have been being tossed around and even persecuted by the unpatriotic colonial agents in the system. These are people like Dr. Nambatia, Matthias Magola, ETC. However, their protracted struggles is finally going to succeed. Dr. Nambatia is moving ahead with government support to isolate important substances that will help us to fight many viruses. Magora and Dr. Chakulaga, now supported by some African banks such as Equity Bank of Kenya, are creating a world-class pharmaceutical group known as Day De Pharma that will make any and all the medicines the country needs and even export. 
Incredibly, three days ago, a group answering to the description of the so-called Financial Intelligence Authority had closed their bank accounts, claiming that they did not know where their money was coming from and what it was doing. Yesterday, I visited one of their huge factories in Matuga, near our, my camp number three, the camp of the NRA, the, the bush war, uh, fighters, near Buambo, in that area during the bush war. Why couldn't this financial intelligence check what these people were doing on the ground? How could they fail to know that the money was coming from equity and other banks? I'm going to get to the bottom of these treacheries by all these elements that have been fighting our revolution. Anyway, the Bible says that whatever you sow, that's what you harvest. Whatever you sow, that's what you harvest. This is in the book of Galatians, Chapter 6, verses 7 to 9, it says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, he will reap in return. The one who sows, who sows please, to please his, fre his flesh, fr from fr flesh he will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up." End of course. As I was visiting Dai Pharma yesterday, the factory which I visited yesterday, I could hardly recognize our ambush sites where we used to ambush <laughs> government soldiers of Kawanda, Matuga, Chigogwa, uh, Migade, Kakerenge, they are all built up now, especially with factories. The only mistake is that some of the factories are built in the wetlands. Those already built or being built should be allowed to continue. Although demolishing an already built factory is not common sense. They are very expensive and very useful. However, I direct UPDF to take an aerial map of that area that will show us the factories already in the wetlands or being built so that no new ones will be added. We want more and more factories, but build, please, build them on dry land, not in the wetlands. The chief administrative officers and the Gombora chiefs and the GISOs in these areas will be held accountable if this is not followed. The import bill of Uganda is normally US dollars 7 billion per, per year, broken down as follows. Animal and animal products, $40 million. Vegetable products, animal beverages, fat and oil, $452 million. Prepared foodstuffs, beverages, and tobacco, $220 million. Mineral products, excluding petroleum, $1.24 billion, $1,246 million. Petroleum products, $956 million. Chemical and related products, $559 million. Plastics, rubber, and related products, $380 million. Wood and wood, wood products, $149 million. Textile and textile products, $243 million. Miscellaneous manufactured items, $271 million. Best metals and their products, $439 million. Uh, Machinery equipment vehicles, one uh, $1,200 million, or $1.2 billion, and so on. So you can see this whole import list, except maybe for petroleum products, 
because our petroleum as we have not started producing or producing our petroleum but many of these uh, imports we can make them here when you look through this list you see that there is no reason why we should import many of these items medicines textiles leather products industrial sugar for use by coca-cola industrial starch for use by the pharmaceutical industries paper packaging materials glass products automobiles bicycles etc etc many of these can and will be made here the coronavirus pandemic by temporarily blocking the channels of dependency what the coronavirus has done has blocked the channels of dependency that's what the, 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 the coronavirus has done and collapsing the economy of leisure and pleasure has reinforced to we the patriots that have for long stood against neo-colonial dependency of the unhealthy Kusaka, Kusaka in Uganda. Kusaka is the act of homestead, of a homestead, of a lazy family that does not grow their own food and have to buy from other families. It is a disgrace to be in that situation in the villages. This is different from Kuturka, butter trade, because with that one, that one is symbiotic. You give what you produce and, what, and get what you do not produce. Uganda's position, Africa's position, has been the unhealthy Kushaka, even what we can produce ourselves. The cabinet has accepted this analysis of emphasizing the, and fully developing the real economy of survival and prosperity on a durable basis, as already pointed out at the beginning. The real economy, capacity, and potential of Uganda are in agriculture, industry, ICT, and some of the services that have durable demand that is not easily affected by crisis. In agriculture, we have bananas, maize, cassava, beans, Irish potatoes, millet, sugar cane, cattle for dairy products, cattle for beef and leather, coffee, tea, cocoa and fish. We are going to produce more and better each of these 14 crops or livestock activities and process industrially each one of them to achieve the full spectrum benefits of each for the local, regional, and the international markets. I can give a few examples to illustrate this point. Our scientist, Dr. Florence Muranga, many years ago, our scientist, Dr. Florence Muranga, many years ago, discovered that flour from bananas can make better and safer bread than wheat flour that contains a substance known as gluten that is not good for human nutrition. With a lot of resistance from the agents of colonialism, I have been funding the banana project, including the patenting of the formula. This year, shillings 9.5 billion has been released, and next year, financial year, 12 billion will be released to conclude this project. The global demand for wheat is worth $43 billion. This is potentially the market that is waiting for the banana flour. The wheat flour imported into Uganda alone today takes $300 million per annum. So you can imagine if, if we could assist our 
sister, uh, Dr. Muranga, to make the the banana flower, which is better than the wheat, the wheat flower. Then all these three hundred million dollars, which is being wasted, will be saved. But we shall be able to give the world by export better flour, healthier than than uh, than, than wheat, the wheat flour, because of the gluten. You come to cassava. Out of cassava, you can get pharmaceutical grade starch to use in making tablets. We have a young pharmaceutical industry making medicines. Making tablets, for instance, needs high grade starch. This is now being imported from China and India. This cost adds 7% to the cost of medicine per unit, moreover, in foreign currency. We are getting cooking gas from the, from the alcohol, from the cassava starch. Animal feeds can be made from cassava flour. Uganda has been importing animal feeds worth 28 billion shillings per year. That's about maybe $7 million. Yet, these are from cassava, from maize. These are crops we have in plenty here. Cassava, we produce 4.1 million tons per annum, and maize 5 million tons per annum. I've already mentioned the issue of industrial grade sugar for use by soft drinks like Coca-Cola and pharmaceutical grade sugar for use in making baby medicines that need sweeteners. With Uganda alone, we import industrial grade sugar worth $40 million per annum. Western foreign exchange. Yet we are suffering with the unsold drinking sugar that simply needs more refinement to save the US $40 million that is spent on that unnecessary import. I have not checked on whether our people have isolated the amount of pharmaceutical grade sugar that is needed to sweeten all the baby medicines that we use in Uganda. However, Uganda imports medicines for humans and livestock, including vaccines, worth $383 million per year. We intend to make most of this here and also to make most of the inputs here, raw materials. You come to dairy products. Uganda is now producing 2.6 billion liters of milk per annum. This rose from 200 million liters in 1986. This rose from 200 million liters in 1986, when Uganda was importing powdered milk from Denmark, adding on Lake Victoria water, and a funny little government company that was answering to the description of the Uganda Dairy Corporation would stamp that product as made in Uganda. The only Ugandanness in the product was the water from Lake Victoria. Today, we have a huge surplus because the demand in Uganda is 800 million liters. Yet the production has hit 2.6 billion liters and is growing. Of course, the surplus, in quotes, itself is artificial. It is simply because the Ugandans are still under-consuming when it comes to the milk the human body requires. According to the World Health Organization, a human being needs 210 liters of milk per annum to get all the calcium, all the, phos the phosphorus the body needs. 
With 43 million Ugandans, the country needs 9 billion liters of milk per annum. Hence, this so-called surplus is actually artificial, but it is the present reality. This, however, is not a problem. The global demand for milk products is worth $718 billion. Uganda can get quite a bit of this. Our farmers and processors, however, need to know that to sell internationally, we must have good quality of milk and cheaper than the milk of New Zealand, Ireland, etc. The market, however, is there. We come to beef, pork, poultry, etc. The global demand for this meat, for this meat is US dollars 946 billion. Uganda can get quite a bit of this money with our 14.4 million cattle, 15.6 million goats, 50 million chicken, 4.1 million pigs, 3.9 million sheep, etc. We just need to work on the quality. Then there is the fish. The global demand for fish and fish products is US dollars 125 billion. The Ugandan portion of the lakes in Arubare, what they call Victoria, Kyoga, Mwitanzige, Albert, Rueru or Masioro, George, Butumbi, Ruchulu, Edward, can produce a total of 447,000 tons of fish per annum if we eliminate the cancer of bad fishing by parasites in our society. In addition to fishing from the lakes, I have been promoting fish farming using the miga. These are the ages of our papyrus swamp. In the age of, of the papyrus swamp is Omuiga. Or the Meje go. If it's not a papyrus swamp, then the, the, the word changes. The Meje with the age of the other swamps. To do fish farming, instead of destroying our precious wetlands with low profits rice, yams, etc. The example we have shown at Limoto in Parisa district, where the population is now earning Uganda shillings 70 million after removing the operational costs per annum from five fish ponds, only using 1.23 acres, instead of the previous seven million shillings per annum when they were using 10 acres of swamp area. We convinced these people to stop growing rice in the swamp, to instead, with our help, do fish ponds on the, on, on the, on the, on the edge of the swamp. And that's what they are earning. They are now earning 70 million shillings from one acre, 1.23 acres, five ponds, instead of the seven million shillings they were earning from destroying 10 acres of the swamp. Everybody can go and see that example in Limoto, in Paris. The swamp in that zone is now fully restored and the community is earning better. At Kaumu, in Ruero, my four fish ponds in one, one acre are earning for my people 68 million shillings per year. Fish farming, therefore, can generate more fish than even the lakes. The swamps of Busoga, Bukedi, Teso, Lango, Chijezi, Ankore, Buganda, and the Nile Valley between West Nile and Achori should only be utilized for this highly profitable fish farming 
and for the environmental protection. Nothing else should be allowed in or near those swamps, lakes, and the rivers. The recent losses to those who had encroached on the land for the lakes and the wetlands and the river valleys should be an eternal lesson to all of us. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, chapter 11, verses 1 to, to 9, there is the story of the Tower of Babel. It says in quotes, and the whole earth was one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of, of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. They gave up. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did, 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 did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So these people had become too, too arrogant. They thought they could build a tower which could, which could go and reach where God was, and, and they could do their own things. And that's what happened. By trying to turn what God said was dry land, or, or what God said was water in, in farmland, we are really uh, opposing God. It is neither common sense nor good economics for anybody to oppose what God arranged. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 verses 9 to 10, God marked the boundaries between dry land and water. It says, and God said, and God said water. Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the dry land appear the dry ground appear. And so it was. God called the dry land land and gathered the water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good to have where water belongs and where dry land belongs. Now, Yoel Museveni, son of Kaguta, comes and says, God was wrong I would make a farm. That's not a wise investment. It's like the other foolish man who built his uh, house on the sun. Most of what we have said above is the implementation of the point number five of the NLM 10-point programs. Build an economy that is independent, integrated, and self-sustaining. Have we not sustained ourselves in this crisis or in a bunch of crises, Corona, coronavirus, locusts, rising waters of the lakes, 
floods, landslides, or floating islands. Much, much of what we said above is the partial integration between agriculture and industry. Our plan now is to intensify, broaden, and fully take advantage of that integration to fill all the unnecessary gaps that I pointed out above and also fully benefit from the global economy by joining the export businesses. The economics of Africa are correctly described. The economies of Africa are correctly described as underdeveloped because indeed they have a lot of potential which is not fully utilized. It is underutilized. It is underdeveloped. We are going to fully develop that potential and become developed countries. We are lucky because we have everything. Agriculture that produces so many products. Entrepreneurial classes that can process all and every agricultural product using appropriate factories. Electricity and other infrastructure elements that assist processing. A large educated young population that can run modern economies. A big regional market created by the, the African Pan-Africanists ever since the time of the Lagos Plan of Action. And huge international markets available to Africa, Uganda included, on account of the historical factors that favor Africa. In the other document, which I will send to the to, to the right honorable speaker and members of parliament, I quote two examples, that of Ireland and New Zealand. Ireland is a very small country with a land of 68,000 square kilometers, about one third of Uganda. 80% of that little country is used for dairy industry. They earn $5.2 billion from that activity alone. New Zealand, from the dairy sector, earns US dollars $7.8 billion. Here in Uganda, we are not talking of one or two activities. In agriculture alone, I have identified for you 14 products, each with the potential for, for earning for us billions of dollars and creating very many jobs. The little we have done in the direction of building an independent, integrated, and self-sustaining national economy of, uh, has helped us, has seen us through the endless regional crisis of uh, the problems in South Sudan, the, the war in Rwanda, the problems in Congo, Somalia, etc., as well as navigating just now through a pandemic of the coronavirus and the other natural calamities I've already pointed out about. The above is all based on the utilization of our agriculture potential and in integrating it with the manufacturing, that is the industry. How about then minerals, forestry, and the human resource, products of the brain from through IT, engineering, ETC. There's even bigger potential there. We are already self-sufficient in cement, and we are exporting cement worth $57 million, if you use the figures of 2019. This was a decline from US dollars $103 million exported in 2013. But this decline is due to the increased internal usage of cement on account of the heavy uh, infrastructure investments we are undertaking and the growth in the real estate sector. We produce 289,000 metric tons of recycled steel, metayimbwa, and we earn $110 million from exporting steel products. So we are satisfying the internal market with these industrial products, but also earning from exporting them. 
We are in the process of developing vertical integrated steel industry from our, our iron ore of Tari uh, to Sukuru in Tororo, Muko in Rwanda, and Putogota in Kanungu. The global steel industry is US dollars 2.5 trillion. Although we are making steel products using recycled scrap, strong structures like dams need fresh and alloyed steel that we are still importing. We end up using US dollars 444 million for this imported higher quality steel products. This we are going to end by developing our own vertically integrated steel industry, as already pointed out. We built a gold refinery at Entebbe. That gold refinery was and is still being fought by the neo-colonial agents. We shall, however, defeat them. The refinery is earning U.S. dollars 1.25 billion dollars per annum. When I was trying to control the mining of gold in Uganda, I was opposed even by members of parliament. They do not want Uganda to have a gold refinery. Refineries do not belong to countries like Uganda. They should be in Dubai, South Africa, ETC, but not in Uganda according to these enemies. We say no, the gold refinery in Uganda will be defended by all the policy instruments. Now that gold is being now that gold is being refined, refined here, Madam Nachobe, using my small using my small innovation fund, should start to teach some of the grandchildren the skills of jewelry. The rich Ugandan ladies will be able to buy the gold jewelry made here instead of squandering money buying the same from distant sources. We already have a good ceramics industry at Kapeka making ceramic tiles, saving US dollars 28.5 million in imports and also bringing in $3 million earned from exports. These ceramics tiles are from our clay, Iwumba. When the copper mining resumes at, uh, uh, at Chirembe, that sector will be linked to the making of cables for electricity, transformers for electricity, rather than what was happening in the, in the 1950s and 1960s, when the copper would only be processed to 94% purity, Bristol copper, that could only be exported as same processed raw material. It could not be used in our cables industry. To do that, you need to purify copper to 99.9 percent, .9 known as cathode copper. Even uranium, I rejected the plans of the new colonial agents of exporting uranium, so that others use it to generate electricity. When Uganda has only a total of potential total potential of 4,000 megawatts on all the River Nile sites and those of its tributaries. A country like Japan generates a total of 288,000 megawatts. Where will Uganda get all the power it needs if hydropower is not enough? Or has it been biologically proven that Africans do not need electricity? As long as I'm in charge of the country, no uranium will ever be exported from Uganda. Let it remain in the ground. When solar power becomes as cheap as hydropower, then the politics and the economics of energy will change. Until then, Sita Kange, I do not give up what is mine. Having fully exploited our mineral wealth by linking minerals with industries, with the real economy, that leaves the wealth based on the human brain and human skills in the form of IT knowledge, engineering, etc. With our educated population, this was a rate 75%. This is now 
a real opportunity. Our scientists in particular, apart from being active in the agro-based industries of starch, processed fruits, dairy products, etc., they have also moved into engineering of designing and fabricating automobiles, the biochemistry of vaccines, etc. Besides, the private sector is also active in import substitution by assembling computers, TV sets, mobile phones, radio sets, etc. here. How will all this be funded? Some of the funding is foreign direct investment, mainly from our Chinese and Indian friends. A lot of new factories are coming up funded in this way. The recent examples of these are semi factory for mobile phones and radios, Sachi factory for TVs, flat irons, radios, Goodwill factory for ceramics. With the Ugandan entrepreneurs, the government has put Uganda shillings one trillion. 1 trillion, we have put 1,000 billion shillings in the Uganda Development Bank to give low interest loans to anybody that wants to go into manufacturing and maybe commercial agriculture. We shall continue putting more money for this purpose into the UDB. The third source of money for this effort is our wealth funds that need to be reinforced. These are especially the MIOGA funds, funds based on the respective specializations, metal work, carpentry. This is on top of the youth, the women, and the nurses funds. A Ugandan family named one of their children Balibaseka. They used to laugh at my efforts, not believing that value will come out of them. Balibaseka. Those who thought that not much would come out of nerds should do, should do something to themselves. Maybe Kwetuga, suicide, out of honor. Because what they laughed at has now pushed Uganda's production of coffee from 4 million 60 kilogram bags to 7 million bags. Uganda now last year exported 7 million bags of coffee. Only now, agriculture needs to tell us on what more guidance that is needed to ensure that the, the, the coffee gives the big size berries known as screen 18 etc once we know what uh, what the science is we shall sensitize our people and they will do it correctly as we as we mobilize them for war and as they did or recent uh, and and they did or recently for the coronavirus and they are doing it when we mobilize our people they will do what is required if we are sincere ourselves. Some of these funds will be modified to deal with the categories of our people that have been affected by the lockdown. Those affected include the border border riders, the saloon operators, the bars people, the nightclub people, the artist, artist ETC. These funds can be used at low interest for these categories of our people to possibly do other activities. They need to think about safer activities, more reliable, rather than these activities which depend so much on no. which are very sensitive to adversities. A 
a team from Operation Wealth Creation sent by Genosere has looked at the budget and suggested ways of savings that can save as much as five trillion from the budget that can do all those efforts mentioned above. Besides, the Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development is proposing the following measures to provide liquidity to private firms that have been affected by the COVID-19 lockdown. Number one, allow corporations, including small and medium-sized enterprises, to delay payment of corporation tax or presumptive tax for taxes due between April and June 20, and for tourism, manufacturing, hot culture, and for culture to defer until September 2020. Two, defer payment of pay-as-you-earn tax by those sectors which are most affected until September 2020. Three, waiver of interest on tax arrears. Four, support to water and electricity utilities in order to ensure continued supply of these essential services to consumers during the period April to June 2020. Five, expedite payment of outstanding VAT, uh, VAT refunds. Six, payment of domestic arrears for goods and services supplied to government by the private sector. Seven, for those unable to pay their loans, government through the Bank of Uganda has already put in, in, in the Gazette the measures to support businesses, including allowing extension of repayment periods, postponement of, of loan repayment for a limited period, relaxing the conditions for non-performing loans, reduction of reserve funds, reserve funds commercial banks are required to keep with the Bank of Uganda, and creating a special liquidity facility to rescue businesses that are not able to meet operational costs due to low demand or reduce production due to COVID-19. Uh, this is, uh, should be uh, eight. Capitalization of the Uganda Development Corporation, UDC, with the Uganda shillings 100 billion to enable government to invest in strategic areas. This is for UDC, not UDB. This money is for UDC now. UDB, one, one, one trillion. UDC, 100 uh, billion. Nine, boosting funding for Uganda Industrial Research in financial year 2021 to continue with the innovation research and incubation of business startups. Ten, securing funding for the development of Kampala Industrial Business Park at Namanve and for power transmission and substation for Mbari, Kapeka, Weyogere, Kasese, Soroti, Ruzira, Jinja, and Bari Industrial Parks. Eleven, provision of an additional US dollar, uh, Uganda, government, uh, Uganda shillings, 300 billion, immediately to boost agricultural production and productivity for the seedlings, fertilizers, irrigation, storage facilities, and value addition. The target crops are coffee, cotton, tea, palm oil, and other oil seeds, cassava, maize, cocoa, uh, and dairy, dairy, beef, and fish production. The, in the budget, the minister will give more details of these, of these efforts. All these efforts will be much easier when our government scientists are paid well. They will be able to contribute to the economy without being distracted by having to survive when it comes to the basics of life. Our scientists must be paid at a level comparable to international standards, but of course taking into account our low cost of living. The prices, our low cost of, 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 of buying products, low cost of living. The products of food here and other products are much cheaper than in other parts of the world. This factor should be taken into account when fixing uh, the salaries of scientists. 
the government will not allow the landlords evicting tenants on account of not paying rent. Discussions have started with both groups and a solution will be found. This lockdown is new for people in the towns. However, we, the cattle keepers, repeatedly face lockdowns lasting for many months whenever there are epidemics of foot and mouth or CBPP. Quarantines are normally imposed. However, we survive and survive later. The people affected should be registered and an appropriate formula of support will be found that does not create dependency. Food distribution for the genuine groups will continue until the problem is over. But I don't want to encourage people to depend so much on food because uh, I talk to the people in the villages on phone. Many of the people in the villages don't need food uh, from anybody. It is only some groups that live on Leja uh, Leja, especially the ones in the towns. But in the, in, in, in the villages, people have their own food. I've been talking to people on phones. I, I bring them random, the ones I know, and you find that. Uh, so the leaders should not mislead people by, by using food for campaign. That is Okulemaza, our people, to make our people disoriented. Yes, we should only give to food to people really who, who don't have an alternative. In 1980, we were here in Kampala with Mama Janet. I was a minister in the government. The salaries were very low. They, were, they could not be able to support us. But we were, our people in the villages were sending us food. They would send us... Uh, uh, millet flour, yes I know, and we just, the, the village would support the town. Even now, some of the village families can support their families. So yes, we shall support uh, the groups which have been dislocated. But as a matter of uh, honesty to God, don't demand food when you, do, when you, when you can feed yourself. When the credit is run, you can bring yourself for bad luck by, by wishing you to be what you are not. If you are all right, say so. Let the one who is not all right be the one to, 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 to stand out and be supported. Food distribution for the general groups will continue until the problem is over. Nevertheless, many families in Uganda do not need free food. They just need seeds and low interest money for borrowing and markets for their products. These measures will deal with the deepening and expansion of the real economy. This does not mean that we do not value or appreciate the vulnerable economy, the economy of leisure and pleasure. Of course, we value it if it is available. We only note its vulnerability. With the real economy consolidated, the vulnerable economy will come back stronger when the pandemic is over. By correctly managing the pandemic, the reputation of Uganda will grow in the world. After the pandemic, people will flock here. The diaspora are now sure of a secure and respectable base, wherever they are, because I speak to some of them there. <laughs> they are more worried than us here. I think they are proud. Of their, of their home base, the Ugandans I, I, I speak to. When, when the virus was starting, some of the people in London were ringing and, and we had to evacuate some of them. And, and yet they had good homes in, in, in London, but Uganda was better. So the Ugandans now, wherever they are abroad, they are proud of their country. Because some of the people some of the people, we are saying that uh, Africa is a place, Africans are going to die. No, we are not maggots. We shall struggle. We are not maggots. Uh, we survived uh, uh, epidemics in the past before the Europeans came here. 
now we are more, more, more informed. Actually, our problem are the, uh, the, the new colonial agents within us. These are the problem. But fortunately, now we are dealing with them. The vulnerable economy will come back stronger once this virus is over. The reputation of Uganda will be up. And I, 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 I'm sure even of Africa as a whole. Because Africans have shown that they can survive. We can survive. We can, we can be more productive. We can build our own capacity. This actually will help the other vulnerable e economy to rush back. They will, I have talked to many foreigners who are happy to be here. So we, we are better here than, 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 than being in other places. Hence, to harvest from the economy of leisure and pleasure, we need to consolidate and expand the real economy. Happily, the leisure and pleasure economy was already integrated with the portions of our real economy. The hotels in Kampala, we are buying a lot of food from our, 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 our agricultural sector. The drying up of the local hotel capacity has created a marketing problem for some of the food industry. That is why some of the farmers are beginning to process the foods, e.g. eggs, into food supplements, out of egg yolk, they are extracting mayonnaise, shampoo, body creams, protein supplements, and from the egg white, they are making low density cholesterol. And from the egg shell itself, it's shankara. They get calcium and potassium. So they are learning how to use the, 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 the whole egg. Omtororo, oruizi, ikshankara, the the yolk and the other egg white, you call it egg white, uh, and the, the shell. Out of milk, apart from cheese, butter, yogurt, etc., they also get casein, which is a protein supplement that is used for bodybuilders, for cancer patients, and it can be used by the pharmaceutical companies to make the digestible shells of, of capsules that carry medicine powder into our stomach. You can imagine we didn't know that the, that the share of the capsule which we swallow is actually from milk. We didn't know. I just knew the other day what, the, the, the factory in Liantonde is, is selling a lot of casein uh, to the United States. So I asked, but what are they using this casein for? They said that they're using it for, uh, for body supplements, protein supplements, but also for making the capsules for, for the medicine which we take from milk. We didn't know. We were just here asleep. Huh? Therefore, the portion of the real economy that we are integrated with the leisure and pleasure industries, will find ways of surviving the temporary collapse of the vulnerable economy. By the time the vulnerable economy stands up again, our agriculture and industry will have broadened their opportunities. There is nothing to lose, only we are becoming wiser and stronger. We have everything. Therefore, in conclusion, the pandemic should help those who had not believed the NRM before that there are two categories of the economy. The real economy around the nine human needs of food, clothing, shelter, medicine, security, infrastructure, health, education, and spirituality, and the leisure and pleasure economy around tourism, entertainment, holiday making, sports, concerts, music, etc. The former is for survival and prosperity, and the latter is additional and optional. In this crisis, Uganda is emphasizing consolidating 
and broadening the real economy, ultimately Uganda will benefit from both. I will conclude this address by asking the whole country to remember some of our well-known citizens that died since the last state of the nation address. These include the late Justice Ntaboba, the former principal judge, the late Medical Gua, chairman of the Uganda Human Rights Commission, the, de the late Dr. Kanyerez Masembe, chairman and co-founder of the Kampala Hospital, former head of the Department of Internal Medicine at Makere University, late Professor Edward Dumba, former executive director of Mlago Hospital, late Major General Biraro, former senior UPDF officer, Later, Major Korimo Kanuti, who hosted the Uganda flag. Later, Ruemba William Apuri, the Under Secretary Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs. Later, Jimmy Chirunda, Chirunda, a former footballer who captained the national team for the African Cup finals in 1978. All the other Ugandans who have passed away since the last State of the Nation address. Through the speaker, I ask all of you to stand up for one minute of silence to remember these people. Thank you. Thank you. On the program of Parliament, in the coming session, the, he the head of the uh, government business in Parliament will, will give the list. I, I, I thought that if I added the list of the proposed legislation, the list would be to too long, and uh, I, I want my message to be clear, concentrated on, on the economy. So with these few words, I thank you. No, they, 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 they have attached the, the legislation here. Uh, but it will be communicated by the, the, the lead of government business. It's better to do it uh, more clearly. I thank you, and I wish you good luck. Excellency. I want to thank you for fulfilling your obligations. And that for 101, Sabbath so one of the Constitution. As the issue of practice, statement will be debated in Parliament. So it is expected that the leader of opposition will make a formal reply to the State of the Nation address, and both will be debated. I would just want to confirm that your statement and the two articles have already been uploaded for members' information on their iPads. Your Excellency, this is the first time in the history of Parliament that there's no official photograph or reception after the address of, of, the, of the State of the Nation. Therefore, the year 2020 is very unique and will stand out that no reception was held, and yet this is the fifth and final State of the Nation address for the test Parliament. We pray to the Almighty God that the COVID-19 pandemic disappears and that the guests in the next State of the Nation will be able to enjoy the reception as before. In the meantime, adjourn the House to Thursday, 11th June 2020, when we shall receive the budget speech. As usual, our members are expected to arrive well before the head of state arrives. Those who arrive late will not be uh, permitted into the venue. So please read the program and be advised about, about the time you will arrive. Uh, for, I'm glad that we have finished well ahead of uh, our normal time of 5 o'clock give time members to transit the curfew and get home by 7 o'clock. House at Jan to 11th June 2020 at 2 p.m. Thank you very much. The anthems in reverse order.